And uh, thank you everyone for coming uh, to be with us tonight for our Seeds 101. Um, this is a free presentation by myself, I'm Jacob, uh, for the really public library and the world um, tonight, 6.30 to 7.30 uh, is what we've advertised. We can go as late as 7.45, but that's a hard cutoff. So we uh, have about an hour here, 10 minutes or so. And I'm a farmer at Bass Lake Farms. And for a long time, I've helped support our Aurelia Public Seed Library housed within the Aurelia Public Library. So every year we get together and we do some events like this, and hopefully we'll be able to do a few more during the year uh, so that um, you have the support you need and we have the opportunity to get together uh, more than once a year to talk about seeds, share seeds, share ideas, and build our community collection. So welcome to Seeds 101. Um, take this opportunity now to uh, introduce yourself in the chat and also post any questions you might have. Um, feel free at any time as the presentation goes on. If you have a question or a comment, just pop it right there in the chat and, we, and I look forward to reviewing them all uh, at the end. These are some of my favorite seeds here on the left. These are some giant sunflower seeds that uh, we've been growing for a number of years. And there I am on the right. So in about 90 to 120 days, these sunflowers go from this little tiny uh, seed into this huge massive plant. And I think the tallest one there we measured at 14 feet, which is pretty incredible. The transformation and uh, the transformative power of seed. So here's our agenda for this evening. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about me just so you know who I am, uh, but I also wanna know more about you. And uh, we're gonna share some of our inspirations for being here tonight. Um, we're gonna have an introduction to literacy or seed literacy. Uh, we're gonna learn a little bit about our seed library and about the seed library uh, movement growing on around us. And then we're gonna dive right into it and we're gonna learn the basics. Uh, what is a seed? And where do seeds come from? And why do we save them? and how to grow them and how to save them. And so if you haven't already, I would put Hascap berry on your agenda. And this is a delicious uh, native berry to the boreal regions of the world. And they grow um, splendidly down here in our climate. They're hardy to zone two, uh, which means they are hardy to minus something like minus 45 degrees Celsius. So their flowers are capable of surviving uh, negative temperatures. And so they've already flowered and they've been pollinated by the bees, and now I see little fruits forming out in the garden. So these berries are the first berry um, ripen, to ripen uh, in our area that I'm aware of. That's edible for us. And they're kind of delicious, so I would definitely put that on your agenda. And one that you can grow from seed. So I am a farmer educator. So I farm at our nearby Bass Lake Farms. Uh, where I've done so for a number of years. We um, typically offer a, a fresh food box program, although we've suspend, suspended that for this year. Uh, we also offer a farm gym program, which is a functional fitness opportunity uh, for people in the community to come out and get fit and grow food alongside us. Uh, we also offer a seed club. So that's a free uh, membership-based organization that we have where people can sign up for events and opportunities and discounts on our seed. Uh, catalog. We do grow and sell some seeds, but a lot of the seeds we grow, we actually share and circulate through our local seed libraries. Uh, I helped start the Toronto Seed Library over 10 years ago now, and I'm just really passionate about growing and saving and sharing seeds with, um, with everyone in our community, and that led me into becoming a, a garden-based educator. So I work with teachers, um, librarians, and others to try to promote uh, seed and food literacy in our community. And I'm also a student at Lakehead University. Um, I'm doing a master's of education and I'm researching this topic as well, garden-based learning. So I would also uh, alert you to our REF, which is the Recreation Research Education Farm at Lakehead we're proposing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but there I am in the bottom right-hand side, uh, proudly uh, displaying um, our Freedom Kale, which is a biennial uh, variety of kale that is gone to seed. There in its second year, it's flowering and it produced I think probably about a quarter million seeds in that 100 foot long row there, which is pretty amazing to think from a handful of seeds. Um, we now have hundreds of thousands of seeds, which is probably more kale than we could ever possibly imagine growing uh, on the farm. 
or in any of the community gardens. So I'm also active there with the really community gardens. So if you don't have your own garden in town, there's lots of gardens uh, popping up all around town. So if you've got questions about how to access community gardens or what's growing on there, I'd love to chat about that too. So yeah, who are you? So post in the chat your name, you know, why you're here, what you like to grow, what you like to learn tonight. And I'm particularly interested in how many of you actually have borrowed seeds from our Aurelia Seed Library. And then how many of those have ever returned seeds? I know that a common uh, challenge with seed libraries is increasing the return rate. Now there's no late fees anymore on any items, let alone seeds. Um, but we do encourage people to, to make some effort to grow and save seed. And hopefully after tonight, you'll have a little more uh, knowledge around how to do that. And does anybody know uh, any guesses what this plant is here on the right hand side? And feel free to pop it in the chat if you have any guesses. And I'm going to uh, reveal the answer in five, four, three, two, one. Strawberry spinach. Now this is a variety of, uh, of, uh, of plant that I found growing in a community garden in Winnipeg. And I was introduced to it by an elder there by the name of Audrey Logan. And it struck me as very interesting. And since I had a little bit of knowledge around seed saving and I actually wander around with envelopes wherever I go, I was able to sneak a few um, fruits into an envelope. And there I was got hundreds of seeds from those fruits. I don't know if you can make it on the image here, but there's little black seeds there that form on those red edible berries that grow off of a flowering stem that comes the second year after um, uh, the plant overwinters. And they produce these de delicious mild green leaves um, that are great in spring salads. And then these edible berries, that's strawberry spinach. And here's literacy, seed literacy. So where literacy refers to the ability to read and write, uh, more broadly, it means competence or knowledge in a specified area. So therefore, uh, basic literacy, I think, is the ability to grow and save seeds. And um, this is something I became very passionate about from a young age. Uh, and I got an opportunity to learn more about it through the wildflower farm, actually, with Miriam and Paul out near Warminster there and they grow a wide selection of um, native wildflowers. So I got to get up and close and personal with seeds and growing and saving seeds there for a summer and that was really excellent. And then I've just been very passionate in exploring the world of seeds since then. Um, and here we helped start a seed library at the iSchool at U of T, which is actually the School of Librarians. My friends and I, um, we were on a mission to try to get a seed library in every library. And I think uh, since we started back in 2012, we've gone from a handful in Ontario to well over 100. So we're, uh, we're well on the way, but we're still lots more to grow. And we have a seed library here at the Aurelia Public Library on the second floor near the Information uh, Services desk, I believe. And there's also a seed library at Lakehead University and the Barry Public Library. And just this morning, I had a talk with CEOs from the Simcoe County Libraries. And I think there's about 10 seed libraries in Simcoe County. So if you're, uh, you're not exactly in Aurelia or you're joining us from elsewhere, definitely go and take a look in your local library or ask your librarians if you have one or if you can start and support one. The idea is pretty simple. You borrow, grow, save, and return seeds. Um, any kind of seed, really, although probably not GMO seeds. Um, but we find in our collections wildflowers, sometimes even tree seeds, herbs, vegetables, flowering plants. And it's all about um, making seeds free, putting seeds in the commons for the common good. And they most typically occur in public libraries, schools, and within community spaces. So what is a seed? What is a seed? Now, a seed is basically an a baby plant, um, an embryonic baby plant. So within that, embryo are DNA instructions, which basically tell the plant how to grow and reproduce and everything it needs to know to continue living and reproducing. Which is pretty amazing to think that in that tiny little seed, there's, there's a complex set of instructions 
that allows that, that allows that seed to flourish and reproduce. That's pretty amazing. Also within that seed, there's nutrients. So you gotta think that the parent plants have packed a powerful lunch for when the seed gets hungry on its growing journey. And finally, the third major component of a seed is its protective cover or its outer coat. So, you know, if the seed gets cold or if it's wet out or hot or any other condition, the seed has this nice solid coat to keep it safe. And so now that you know there's, you know, the, the DNA, there's the food, there's the coat. When the, the seed is actually alive, so it's, when you have a seed, if you're holding on to seeds in your hand, you've saved them last year. Now that seed, it's alive. It's pretty much dormant. It's just kind of waiting for the conditions, the right conditions to sprout, to germinate, to grow. Um, but in its dormancy, it's slowly consuming its, its food. So seeds don't live forever, like none of us do. Um, but some seeds, they can survive for many, many years. Some seeds are surviving for a year or two, some for five or 10 years, some for potentially hundreds of years. And that can depend on a lot of different factors, but it also depends on how well they're stored. So all that to say, when the seed runs out of food, it's no longer viable and it, it won't grow. And cold weather can encourage seeds to hibernate or go dormant. Um, so slowing the metabolism down, it'll consume less food and can survive longer. So sometimes when we see, uh, you know, seed banks or other seed collections, they're often put into some kind of cold storage. Now, maybe not freezing temperatures, um, but definitely cooler temperatures. So when we're talking about storing seeds, you definitely want to keep them in cool and dry locations. Now, where do seeds come from? I think we're all or mostly adults here. Um, however, the answer to this question is plant sex. So plants reproduce sexually, um, often with the aid of pollinators, um, but sometimes they're also self-fertile, and we'll get into that. But seeds are basically, like I said, baby plants. And so that's, that's the thing. That's, that's what happens, everyone. There it is. But where do seeds come from? Um, seeds are plants in their embryonic form, but not all plants are seeds. That is to say that some plants actually reproduce by spores and some plants are seedless or infertile. Whereas other plants are self-fertile, meaning they can reproduce on their own. They have both male and female parts that are compatible and will produce a viable seed. Whereas others need a partner and are pollinated by pollinators in the wind. So those are bees, butterflies, moths, ants, beetles, bats, birds, humans, anything that can transfer pollen from one area to another, one flower to another. And so pollination is that act of transferring pollen grains from the male part of a plant, the anther, to the female part of the plant, the stigma. And once the pollination is complete, fertilization takes place and a seed or many seeds are born. And so cross-pollination can occur when two different varieties of the same species exchange pollen, resulting in an offspring that shares characteristics of both parents, like a labradoodle, but for plants. Um, just, you know, as all of us, I assume, are, you know, born from two different parents, we're all a combination of our parents, uh, so too are plants. And so some plants like tomatoes, peas, and beans have what some would call a perfect flower. Uh, they're self-fertile and they have both male and female parts within the same flower. Therefore, they don't require wind or animals to pollinate. Whereas other plants like spinach have distinct male and female plants. So you can have a, a male spinach plant and a female spinach plant. So if you're growing spinach for seed, you need to make sure that you have a large population size so that you have both male plants and female plants flowering at the same time. 
Whereas plants like pumpkins, you may have noticed, will have either male flowers or female flowers. And I've, uh, and you, there's an image there which shows the difference. So sometimes people will grow a pumpkin, um, a single pumpkin plant, and there's lots of flowers and no fruit. And that's possibly because there are no male and female flowers flowering at the same time, uh, or there's an issue of pollination. So when we're growing seeds, you know, professionally or on a larger scale, it's really important that we have a large population size. Um, therefore, we'll have a, a higher likelihood of pollination. Um, we'll also have a greater diversity and healthier population. And also some technical terms you may be interested in uh, taking note of, which hybridization um, or hybrids, GMOs and heirlooms. These are some often terms that come up over time. Uh, and hybridization uh, occurs naturally, but most hybrid seeds that you would find in the grocery store, like uh, if they have the words F1, for example, that means the first generation, there's, they're usually deliberate crosses of two specific lineages of plant to ensure that the offspring has the desired traits that growers um, demand. And these are often traits like uniformity um, or disease resistance or color or some other trait that makes it easier for a grower to uh, grow a larger scale, um, making, it, making it easier for the grower in one way or another. And so you can do this at home. You can, you can hybridize two different tomatoes. You can hybridize two different squashes to try to breed your own squash. Uh, you may note that this also happens naturally. So you may find like one year you're growing, uh, you know, a yellow pear tomato, which I have up there in the right. And then the next year it's something totally different. And that, that happens. And that's the beauty of uh, growing and saving seeds is uh, possibility of diversity and uh, the possibility of something even better coming along in your garden. Um, so another term that you may be interested in is genetically modified organisms or even genetically engineered um, plants or animals. Um, so in this case, um, these, have, these organisms are having their genes edited in a way. So certain genes are being turned on or turned off or they're being, or, or certain genes are being inserted um, typically from one species into another. So this would not happen naturally. Um, um, and this is what's happening in laboratories around the world. And increasingly, this technology is becoming more widely distributed. And companies and governments are permitting the, uh, the genetic modification of all kinds of different life forms, uh, not just plants, but, you know, uh, animals as well. And pretty soon, if we're not careful, human beings will have superhumans wandering around. Um, but that's the slippery slope. If we allow for one thing, then um, it, it can really be uh, something we didn't bargain for. So there's a lot of concern around the, the widespread adoption, the rapid adoption of uh, genetic uh, engineering technology. Um, and it's largely happening within our food system. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, GMOs and then heirlooms. So you may have heard heirloom varieties, and these are those that have been grown and saved for a long time, passed down through generations, uh, typically evolving, uh, adapting to changing climate conditions. Uh, and ideally, um, every time we grow and save them, we're actually selecting the best and we're improving on the desired traits. And here I'm pictured, um, with an ancient squash, an Anishinaabe moan, uh, it was given the name Gete Okosamin, or ancient squash. Uh, and I was gifted some seeds again by my friend Audrey Logan when I visited Winnipeg. And these seeds uh, have quite an amazing story um, passed down through uh, the centuries from indigenous gardeners, uh, I believe from the Miami nation. Um, and they're beautiful, huge, beautiful, delicious squash. And I was really, uh, thankful to be gifted these seeds and to, sh and to be able to share those forward. And so seeds are gifts from our ancestors and, in, and they are our ancestors. So seeds are alive. They have needs and life goals and dreams uh, to grow and reproduce. 
Seeds have co-evolved with us over our entire history on this planet. Um, and many need us just as much as or more as we need them. For many cultures, and especially for indigenous peoples, seeds are considered to be sacred and also considered to be relatives. And so uh, I learned through, you know, a number of different indigenous elders, in particular, uh, Frederick Wiseman in his book, Seven Sisters, that we have a duty to save them, seeds, as they have duties to nourish and protect us in return. So um, really reframing how we look at seeds. Seeds aren't just, you know, an inanimate object that we just put in the soil and then plants grow. Uh, they're not just, you know, you know, commodities or, you know, things we buy on the store shelves and then we forget about them uh, every year and we just, you know, put them in the soil or we throw them out. Seeds are living beings and, uh, and they are special and they're significant and they really demand and deserve more attention and respect than what they're currently given. And so from an evolutionary perspective, we literally share a common ancestor with all of these plants. Um, we have literally the same parents. And most of the seeds that are grown for food nowadays have been cultivated for hundreds or thousands of years um, by people around the world. And these plants have been, you know, in some ways domesticated from their wild relatives. And so on the right here is kind of the, um, a brief history of the domestication of teosinte or maize, maize um, from Central America. And corn, you know, as many of us know it, wasn't always like that. It didn't always look uh, like it does on the right there. In fact, it was at one point, a, you know, very much different, but over years of selective breeding, growing and saving and mutations and, and selections. Um, indigenous peoples have selected and grown and given us corn. And corn is now one of the most widely grown crops in the world. And it supports uh, a population of over 7 billion people now on this earth, that and rice and potatoes and a few other staple crops. So our seed system is, is complex. Um, we can find seeds in our natural environment and uh, we can save them ourselves from mature plants. We can also store seeds for many years. And so we can sometimes find seeds in our homes, in our communities. We may find them in an old shed or an old barn or an, or an old relative who has a box of seeds somewhere. Um, one day we found seeds, a hundred year old seed collection at the Restore in town. This is from the, uh, the Dominion of Canada and the Department of Agriculture and an old uh, leather pouch with about 50 glass vials of seeds that were a hundred years old and and I haven't tried to grow them yet although I look forward to a time where I have an opportunity to try to see whether or not they're still viable um, and if you have any seeds stored at home you might and if you're not sure you could always ask a squirrel they usually have a good cache of seeds going somewhere um, but also seeds can be bought from seed farmers seed companies and retailers in grocery stores hardware stores garden centers etc um, and today many seeds can be found and bought through the internet and here's a picture that I took a few years ago of a wild plum pit sprouting. So it's not just vegetables that we're growing from seed, but I also love growing tree seeds and fruit trees as well from seed. You can do that. Um, it's often discouraged, but you can, and I invite you to learn more and uh, join me in growing, especially native edible uh, fruiting perennial plants like these wild plums. And you may be familiar, but this is Svalbard, the global seed vault. So this is the Doomsday Vault, and it's the largest collection of seeds on Earth. And it's a backup of national seed banks and other collections. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, hopefully, uh, we won't need it too much this century, although a number of countries have already made use of it as national seed collections in war-torn countries are destroyed. They have the opportunity to back up seeds here or natural disasters or other humanitarian crises we see uh, emerging around the world. Uh, seeds are not well protected and we could lose thousands of years of, um, of accumulated seed wealth in a single event. So that's why it's important that we all do our part to grow and save seeds and try to preserve the diversity of seeds that exist today so that future generations will have 
an opportunity to enjoy that, which we did. And so why do we save and grow our own? So I've found as a farmer that seed companies can be unreliable. Um, periodically, they can shut down, they can you know, close their operations. They can even discontinue varieties without notice. Um, and that can leave us out. Um, we may not have access to our favorite varieties year over year. So saving our own seed can ensure uh, local seed security and seed sovereignty. Here in Canada, we have very few seed producers. Most of the seeds we grow in our gardens and on our farms are imported seeds. So if something were to happen to those borders, like a global pandemic, for example, then uh, it may be more difficult to access seeds in the global market, which is something I experienced over the last few years. Um, whereas if you grow and save your own, you can save your favorite plants. You can even begin selecting from those populations and selecting your favorite traits. And then year over year, you're actually developing and breeding your own plants, which is very exciting. Um, you, can re and you can reduce costs that way. You can improve seed diversity and you can create locally adapted varieties. Um, but also I think, and this is one of my favorite things is you actually get to build relationships with plants and the environments we grow in together. And that can be really meaningful, especially if you carry that over uh, a lifetime and share that with other people around you, share that with your children and your, your family and your, and your neighbors and your friends. And at the end of the day, it can actually be quite fun to grow and save seeds and quite rewarding um, to be able to share those seeds with your friends um, years later, in fact. So I invite you to be a seed grower. And um, also, you know, I'm, I'm working here towards uh, seed freedom as part of a global network of seed growers and savers who are all working together to liberate seeds from corporate control. Now, corporations have their role to play in our uh, economy and society, but personally, I don't think that seeds should be patented. I don't think that seeds should be restricted. Um, I don't think seeds are could be considered to be one's intellectual property. I think seeds are living beings. Um, and so I think that they should be treated as such and not simply our property or a corporate property where some people can access and others can't. Um, so seed freedom um, here, and this is from Vandana Shiva, who's a global seed, uh, seed expert and seed campaigner and many other things. Uh, she says, seed freedom is threatened by the deliberate transformation of the seed from a renewable self-generative resource to a non-renewable patented commodity. The most extreme case of non-renewable seed is the Terminator technology developed with aim to create sterile seed. And to this end, we will save seed. We will create community seed banks and seed libraries. We will not recognize any law that Ill illegitimately makes seed the private property of corporations. And we will stop the patents on seed. Uh, so we organized back in the day, uh, Toronto Seed Freedom Convergence. And you can see there, uh, corn breaking the shackles of uh, genetic engineering and genetic control. So now getting into it, seed starting materials. So in order to save seeds, you actually have to grow them first. Um, although sometimes seeds, they just grow themselves, like you're walking down the street and there's a seed and it's just grown itself, it's doing its thing, uh, and they don't actually need us. Um, but as mentioned earlier, some seeds actually, they kind of do need us because we've brought them along for this journey over the last few hundred, few thousand years, and they may or may not have a good chance of surviving outdoors without us. Like basil, for example, that's not really a plant that does well in Canadian winters. So you're not likely to see basil, um, you know, living in the wild uh, out, outside in, in, uh, in Aurelia all year and doing its own thing. Basil really needs our support. So you need to be prepared to grow your own seeds. And here I have prepared a little materials checklist. So the first thing to consider is seeds. And when you're selecting your seeds, the first thing I like to ask is, what do you like to eat? Um, start there. Um, Start with what you like to eat, what you like to grow, um, uh, maybe what other people in your family or in your neighborhood like to eat. 
Um, you definitely don't want to start with something that you don't like to eat because you kind of want to be invested in it. And then you're going to look to find your seeds somewhere. You can look at the uh, really seed library. We have a catalog online on our website. You can ask friends, relatives. You can go to check out your local garden centers. You can check online. Uh, now you've got your seeds. You're going to need some kind of container to grow in. And I love being creative and resourceful with whatever I got. So I got a, a yogurt container here that I'm growing a ton of tomatoes in right now. But I would invite you to search container garden ideas on, uh, the, inter on the internet for inspiration. Um, and then also search your environment and use what is available. Be creative and resourceful. Uh, it's, this is an opportunity to recycle materials, um, making them into something um, valuable and productive. Or skip the container altogether and just direct seed right into the earth. Um, but if you are going to be starting indoors, you're going to need some soil. Um, and it's best to start with some kind of potting mix. Now, potting mix is usually a mix of uh, compost, some kind of growing medium like peat, coconut choir, vermiculite, perlite, um, potentially sand. Uh, and other organic materials. So it's just a, it's a mix of light um, organic matter that really helps root development and holds water. And then you have your soil. And I would, if you're doing this indoors or even outdoors, I'd recommend getting a tub or some kind of tray or container to mix, um, mixing in some water, make sure you get rid of the clumps. I like to use a wheelbarrow outside and I get a shovel and I kind of mix up a, a lot of potting mix all at once. And then from there, uh, you make sure you have your water. You always gotta have water readily available if you're growing seed. Wow, seeds love that stuff, water. So you're gonna need a can or maybe a spray bottle. Uh, you don't wanna overwhelm the seeds with too much water all at once. And then of course, a water tray to catch water under your container. And on that note, I'd also recommend you investigate sub-irrigated planters um, if you're ever doing raised container gardens or planter boxes. So that's sub-irrigated planters and that would help you to reduce labor and reduce watering needs and maybe result in a better uh, crop at the end of the day. And if you're curious, there's actually some on display out in front of the St. Paul Center, Peter Street and Coldwater Road in downtown Aurelia. They've gone with the sub-irrigated planters successfully. And then you're gonna need a shelf, table, windowsill, uh, basically considering where will your garden live. Uh, you want to make sure it gets full sun. Um, and that's typically six hours or more a day. Um, you can even uh, invest in artificial light as displayed here in the picture, um, which can be really effective as well. Um, but nothing beats natural sunlight outdoors uh, eventually. Uh, but until then, you want to be attentive and you want to be patient as those seeds can take days or weeks to sprout and grow into something uh, that resembles a plant you might want to put outside. So now the basic steps, you've got your materials, uh, you've filled your container with the potting soil, you've sown your seeds uh, into the soil. Now one question you may have is, you know, how deep do I space them? Um, how much water do I give them? How much heat and light? Now each seed is different, although there are kind of groups and there's families of plants and they are, and within the family they can be pretty similar. So I would say, you know, if it's a hot weather plant, then you might need more heat in order to germinate that seed. If it's a cool weather plant, then typically they'll germinate at cooler temperatures. Uh, and another general rule of thumb is the bigger the seed, the deeper you plant it. So if it's a really small seed, then you can kind of get away with just putting it near the surface or uh, just under the surface, uh, a couple millimeters, just barely covering it with soil. And then you want to make sure that the seeds are kept moist, but not too damp. You don't want them, you know, swimming. Um, they do breathe and they need that air to breathe. And then also you want to keep them from drying out. So one thing that you can do is uh, like I've wrapped a little plastic bag actually over top of my yogurt container. When I seed my plants, I give it a little water and then I cover it with some kind of bag or lid or something just for a few days. And that helps keep the moisture in so I don't have to water it every day and then I check on it regularly until it sprouts and then as soon as I see something sprouting then I take the lid off and I get usually get pretty good germination that way. So you're going to water um, water your plants regularly and fertilize as needed and compost teas can be a quite an effective way to get the nutrients right to the plants as they need it. So how do seeds grow? 
So most of our garden seeds will require a combination of heat and moisture in order to break their dormancy, you know, wake them up and sprout. But all seeds are different and their unique germination requirements are typically reflective of the environmental conditions in which they've evolved. That is to say, peppers did not evolve in northern in a nor uh, cold northern climate. Peppers are a tropical plant. So if you've ever tried germinating peppers, you may notice that you'll have much greater success the warmer the soil is. So some people even use heat mats, or if you have a warm place in your, in your indoor uh, living space, uh, get your peppers there. Uh, they'll grow faster, they'll germinate faster with warmer temperatures. Whereas if you've ever tried growing a plum from seed, you'll know that these plums have evolved, they have evolved in our climate, so they do get a very cold winter. So they actually require a combination of uh, warm and moist stratification, which is basically sitting in a warm and moist environment for about 30 to 60 days. And then they require a cold and moist stratification, which is sitting in a cold and moist environment for another 90 days approximately. And then after that, they require a good amount of heat in order to germinate. So these can be a little more complex and that goes for a lot of our native wildflowers and trees. That they, It's just that they've evolved uh, in a climate in which they've set their seed in the fall and if they were to germinate in the fall those little baby plants would be killed by our deadly winters. So they've evolved to know when um, it's time it's safe to sprout in the spring. So we can actually mimic those conditions um, in different ways. Um, for example we can you know put a moist paper towel in the fridge over winter and that can mimic cold moist stratification. Um, however, some seeds have also evolved to require a forest fire, whereas others need acidification or to pass through the digestive tract of an animal, or some seeds with a really thick coat will actually need scarification. So you need to actually scar that coat or, or get an abrasive like a sandpaper to actually get them going. Um, and some seeds can take days, others can take weeks or months. Um, but most, not to worry, most of the garden veggies that we're going to be growing have evolved in nice warm climates. So they're not gonna require a very complicated um, germination um, requirements. But now you know, sometimes plants are a little trickier than you give them credit for. And that's because they're smart and they've learned um, a thing or two from their environment and they've adapted accordingly. So now you're, you've, you've started your seeds, you've grown them, and now you wanna save them. And here's some of the materials that you might need in order to do that. So I love to have a lot of clean and dry bins like Rubbermaid bins and, and other size bins on hand to collect the mature dry seeds or dry pods or seed heads, um, like a dried sunflower head or something. I would cut that. I would use pruners to cut the stem or the seed head and put it into a, a bin. Um, but then you're gonna need a covered area uh, depending on the scale in which you're saving seeds, like if you have hundreds of sunflower uh, heads that you're trying to save from, you might need a, a large covered area. But if you're just doing it, you know, in your backyard, you can probably bring that inside. Um, and I like to use tarps in a greenhouse um, with good airflow where I lay the seeds down to dry. Although seeds like sunflowers, I have to protect them. I have a cage because I have to protect them from all kinds of animals who would otherwise love to eat them. And then I use screens, uh, sieves, colanders, uh, and et cetera, to try to separate the seeds from the chaff. Now, the chaff is a technical term. It'll be on the exam at the end of the presentation, so I hope you're paying attention. Um, but basically, the chaff is any part of the seed, any part of the plant that is not the seed. And so I like to have nice and clean seed uh, for long-term storage but you don't need to get every bit of chaff off, but the chaff is where, you know, potential insects could be living or other disease or moisture could, could creep in. So having nice clean seed really does help improve the quality of seed over time. Also use plates and bowls to dry the seeds out. Um, but then there's also wet seed, um, like seeds from tomatoes, for example, and we'll get a little more into that. But I use buckets to ferment seeds um, or clean them with water. Um, with a hose or a tap. And then you're going to need some envelopes. Um, I like size three coin envelopes that I get in bulk online. 
um, but you also want bins to store your seeds in. You can seal them, nice sealed bins, and of course, labels for storage. Always label your plants, label your seeds, label, label, label. You never want to uh, spend all this time only to forget what you're growing. Trust me. Um, and then if you're, uh, you know, a seed stir like me and you're obsessed, then you may want a digital catalog to keep track of all your seeds. Uh, now through our seed club, our seed collection, I have over, uh, entered in over a thousand different entries into our seed collection. These are seeds uh, that we've been growing and saving over the last 10 plus years. People, random people attack me on the street and give seeds to me and expect me to save them and do something with them. And and I have to enter them into the catalog and hope that one of you in our community will be able to grow them because I can't grow all of them. It's too many. Um, but I have been working on this catalog in order to keep track uh, because otherwise it can be kind of kind of complicated when you start saving that many seeds. But hopefully you won't get that down that rabbit hole too quickly. Um, but you also want to have a cool and dry location to store your seeds. Um, as long as the, it's a climate stable, uh, location that should be fine but cool and dry is best. You just want to avoid fluctuations of heat and moisture uh, that can really stress the seeds out and lower their lifespan. Now tomatoes are one of the most popular seeds to save because people love growing their own tomatoes and they love saving their own tomato seeds and regrowing their favorite varieties year over year. And we grow like over 30 different kinds of tomatoes on the farm. And so with tomatoes, and you can apply this to other wet fruit, um, like anything that comes in a, most fruits, like peppers or eggplant or squashes or tomatillos or ground cherries. Um, so you can save seeds from mature or overripe and even rotting fruit. And so, I'll, you know, I've passed through community gardens in Toronto and other cities and there's a rotting tomato, a single rotting tomato on the ground, and I just pop that into a little jar. And I smash that fruit in a bucket of water um, in a jar, and then I let it sit for two to three days, and it will ferment and it will get stinky, so you have to be prepared for that. Um, but after that period of time, ripe and mature seeds will sink to the bottom, immature seeds will float to the top um, along with the pulp. So then you can pour off the goop, you can fill a bucket with water, pour them all off all the floating goop and skins and stuff. And you repeat that process until the seeds are by, by themselves in clean water. Then you can pour them all through a fine mesh strainer to remove seeds from the water. And then I usually run it under a hose again, just to make sure everything is nice and clean. And then I put the seeds onto a clean plate in a safe location out of direct sun to dry for like one or two days until you know they're visibly dry. And then I keep them safe from animals, birds, mice, insects, annoyed family members, etc. cetera. Um, and I put dried seeds in a paper envelope and store in a secure location like a bin with lid. Um, it's important you keep them, you know, lidded. And then don't forget to label it every step of the way, especially if saving more than one variety of seed, uh, like more than one variety of tomato, because it can be very difficult to distinguish between varieties um, of tomato seeds without a label. Now, just going back to this first point, um, I don't know if I, I emphasize this, but it's, it's actually better to save fruit, save seeds from mature or overripe fruit. Uh, and you have to imagine that the fruit here uh, is like a, you know, that's carrying a baby inside it, the seed. And the longer that fruit has to gestate that seed, uh, the longer term it has to grow, the more uh, healthy and viable that seed will be at the end of its life. So you may notice here in the collection of tomatoes, like some of those tomatoes may be less ripe than others. And it's typically because they're younger than others and the seeds haven't had as much time to form. So you want to be saving seeds from really ripe and mature fruit. Um, and so rotting fruit is totally fine. But not too rotting that the seeds are actually, you know, you know rotting as well. And here's some imagery of our uh, seed saving for tomatoes. So on the top left there, you see all the different colors that tomatoes, uh, the tomato juices take there. And that's my fermentation station, tomato ferment. And then pouring it off into the screens and buckets. And then I have them all labeled there in shoe boxes. 
and then I've laid them out onto screens. And as you can see, that's a that's too many tomato seeds there. I have of that tomato bond girl. I have like a million seeds. It's just too many. So we're just sharing seeds left, right, and center here um, through the seed libraries. But you know, it's not hard to be able to grow and save a lot of seed, especially with uh, a little knowledge, a little litter seed. So I look forward to seeing what everyone here uh, is able to accomplish. And here's some additional resources. You can find lots of great books at the Aurelia Public Library, uh, especially books on growing and saving seed. Uh, they have a seed request form online. There's also a national organization that just made their memberships free, which is Seeds of Diversity Canada. Um, and there's lots of other regional organizations doing great work um, on seed diversity and, and seed production and participatory um, plant production and other things. Uh, there's lots of videos on YouTube. You know, just get it there. Try it, try it yourself. You know, do trial and error and you'll learn a lot just from the experience. Uh, phone or message a friend. Uh, you can always join our seed club, it's free. And you get exclusive deals on seeds, events, tips, and more. Um, and here's some uh, of our images here by our uh, Collaborator M, who's a great illustrator. Uh, there we have our seed camper, our seed school entrance exam, and the germ test. We do a germination test activity for kids uh, in schools. And then here's some further considerations for you. So, um, you know, you're probably starting seeds indoors. You probably already have some seeds started indoors if you're uh, you're anything like uh, like me and you're gonna be transplanting outdoors in containers or in the ground. Um, you can direct seed outdoors. You know, as soon as the soil can be worked, many things, many cool other plants can be sown directly outdoors. But most things now, I think we're probably in the clear. I don't think we're gonna be getting any more frost temperature, although you never know with this climate. Um, but typically we would be planting our warm weather plants outside after at the end of May. Um, then you've gotta make sure that you're actually caring for those crops. Uh, that's a responsibility and you got to take care of them. Um, but you can also extend the season in different ways. So a lot of people think, you know, gardening doesn't start until the end of May, but that's not true. Um, you know, there's plenty of things that are sprouting in the garden now and there's many fast growing cool weather crops that, you know, you could be harvesting from pretty soon. Lots of perennial plants um, working with diversity. We can grow lots of different things that are harvested at different times of the year. You can also uh, season extension technologies like greenhouse, hoop houses, cold frames, uh, low tunnels. Um, I look forward to uh, interacting with y'all at, at uh, future events, um, doing different seed saving and sharing events through our seed library. We're also, there's lots of community gardens in town and, and hopefully we'll get our seed gardens growing, um, which will be dedicated seed gardens around town. We're growing seed for seed, um, but there's events happening. Uh, this weekend, the community gardens at Lakehead, and, and there's community gardens at High Street Park and a number of churches around town as well. And then lots of schools are running garden-based learning programs. I'd encourage you to look into horticultural therapy. Um, mental health is a huge issue now affecting so many of us, and you know, getting out there and working with plants can be very therapeutic. It can be really good for our mental health. Uh, it's also good for our physical health, just to get outside, get, get our bodies moving in different ways. Um, and then there's a lot we can do to promote sustainable agriculture generally in our community um, and surrounding farmlands, uh, which brings us to local food systems. So if you want to have that conversation, reach out, direct message me. I'm happy to talk more. Uh, and then the REF, um, which is our recreation and research education farm that uh, fellow students and I are proposing for Lakehead University. And um, that's to permanently protect 20 acres of the farmland to create this world-class facility with community. Uh, kitchens and greenhouses, um, outdoor bread ovens, picnic areas, and all kinds of different recreational programming for children, youth, and seniors, and all ages in between. Uh, production plots for local food banks and emergency food programs, research plot, experimental plots, orchards, you know, pollinator gardens, you name it. And uh, we're envisioning it. Um, but we need everyone to sign on to show the, uh, the university that there's support for this vision. And we've taken a sports theme here. If you can tell, Lakehead Farm Club, Lakehead FC. And there's the ref there, the, uh, the B with the red card. 
because we think that uh, recreation uh, of this farm could actually promote all kinds of different recreational elements and get our get us moving. And uh, so that's agricultural athletics. And here it is on campus. That's where we're proposing to create the farm. As you can see, it's just most of the year it's just a lifeless um, patch of patch of dirt. Um, we're looking to transform it into a, uh, a lush and enriched learning environment for the whole community. So happy seeding, everyone. And now I'm going to check the chat for questions. All right. Now, uh, if you have more more questions, feel free to keep popping them in there. And uh, thanks, Mary. It looks like you had to go, but thanks for joining us. Um, Anne asks, can you use packaged seeds that are a couple years old? Yes, you can. Um, typically, seeds that are sold in Canada um, have a, a commercial viability standard, which basically means that, um, you know, if, if you're going to be going out and selling seeds, you want to make sure that a certain percentage of them are going to be viable. And farmers and gardeners depend on that. Um, so seed companies try to ensure that. However, after the first year, you, you, it's hard to find seeds being sold that are over a year old, but most seeds will survive for many years. So um, they may be below their commercial viability standard, but that standard may be 95% viability. So if only 90% of them are viable, then they're below the standard, but still nine out of 10 will grow. So definitely I would, I would give every seed a chance to grow. Um, and, you know, I've used seed packs that are 10 years old or more and most seeds grow. So it depends, but definitely give it a shot. If the seed packs are older, typically I would just seed more. Um, I would overseed so that I ensure uh, something germinates. Uh, Lizzie here says it feels amazing to save seeds and then watch them grow the next year. Totally. Uh, and I think that that feeling of joy only compounds the longer you do that and the more people you involve. Um, Sue says, hi, I'm Sue, and I live on a sandy forested farm on Old Berry Road where the meadows are now filled with wildflowers and grasses. I'm interested in saving seeds from the native plant life to share as well as receiving seeds of heirloom and native edibles, herbs, fruits, and vegetables. I've not used the really seed library as yet. Wow, Sue, nice to meet you. Um, my tip for saving seeds, you know, of plants that you may never have saved seeds from before is just, just go and observe them. Observe them through their life cycle. Um, a lot of plants now, they'll just be waking up. They'll just be in their vegetative state. Uh, but eventually you'll see they, they're starting to, they'll start to flower. And go and take note of that. Go and look at those flowers, you know, take an inspection, take pictures, uh, learn their names. Um, you know, follow up with them. Go back out there and watch how those flowers are forming and developing and and try to see whether or not, you know, there's going to be seeds coming anytime soon, then eventually keep going back out there and you really get to know them. And then you'll, you'll be forecasting when those seeds are ready. And then eventually, you know, you'll find seeds just falling all over the ground. And that's when you can go and make sure you're saving some for yourself as well, so that you can try growing them yourself. And I love just trying to save, you know, seeds from anything and, and it can be done. And uh, Shanika says here, how can you tell the difference between GMO and non-GMO seeds? I'm wondering if we are to share our seeds, is there a way for us to know and tell? Now, Shanika, that's a great question. And I would say without, um, you know, uh, a high-tech laboratory, you're probably never going to be able to tell the difference between a GMO and a non-GMO seed just from looking at it. So really, we have to um, trust the origin and the provider of those seeds. Typically, in order to access GMO seeds to begin with, farmers are required to sign a, a license and user agreement um, that specifies um, the conditions of use. And so these are not typically circulated among the community, nor are they available for purchase from most retailers. You have to go to special sources to purchase those types of seeds because they're regulated. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, accidentally come, getting GMO seeds in our seed libraries in our community. Um, and there's also very few varieties of seeds that are currently GMOs. I think there's, you know, last time I checked, there was like six different plants in Canada that were approved as uh, GMO plants in Canada. So definitely something to be mindful of and be aware of, but 
um, unlikely that we would find them kind of popping up in our library. And even if they are genetically modified or uh, plants, I would say that, um, and we do come across them, then, you know, what's stopping us from loving those plants like we would love, you know, any other of our plants in our garden, just because they were, you know, uh, genetically engineered, would you, would you love, if you had one child who was genetically engineered, would you love them any less? Just something to think about. Um, Lisa, I was a librarian for 20 years and love the idea of a seed library. Seed libraries and libraries are a natural fit, I think. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen them popping up all over the world. And Maureen says, um, I'm a passionate gardener, both flowers and of course, vegetables, herbs. I haven't used the seed libraries yet, but I've done a bit of seed saving myself, especially last year, lots of things to learn. I've started growing wild columbine, beautiful flower, uh, false indigo, that was tough. Red oaks from oak acorns and foxglove this spring. Amazing. Now, I love this uh, growing flowers and vegetables and herbs. And, you know, once you become a seed, a seed farmer, you really start, you realize that most plants, vegetables, herbs, they're flowers too. Flowers, you know, people grow plants that have showy flowers, but most plants that we grow in our gardens have flowers. And I think um, all flowers are pretty showy. Um, of course, some are showier than others, and I love, you know, I love me some gladiolas and and uh, and uh, zinnias and cosmos in the garden, and like the other, like most gardeners. But I also do have an appreciation for vegetables when they're in flower, and I would encourage you to let your vegetables flower and take note of their beauty. Now, although those wild columbines, the indigo, and the, the oaks, and the foxglove several of those may require that cold stratification that I was talking about. Um, and if anybody doesn't know what false indigo is, there's a ton of it growing in the roundabout by Food Basics. Just a little tip, and there tends to be quite a few seeds there. You didn't hear that from me. Shanika says, is it all edible? I think you may be talking about the uh, strawberry spinach, and both the leaves and the fruit are edible. Uh, I think the stalk is probably pretty tough, um, but yeah, it's a pretty cool plant to have both leaves and an edible fruit. And uh, Lizzie said, I just got that from the seed library, probably the strawberry spinach. Hi, my name is Anne. I love to garden and would like to produce my own seeds, my own from seeds. I have gotten seeds from the library. Amazing. Uh, Janet guessed raspberry. Um, kind of looks like la raspberry a bit. Um, Lisa says, I've been in garden for many years. Glad to know Jacob be part of the community gardens. I love the seed library and use it during the pandemic. I've donated seeds also. Yes, thank you, uh, Lisa, for all your donations of seeds over the years. They've been mulch appreciated. Um, Scott Bowles says, hi, my name is Scott. I'm here to learn more about gardening and growing your own food at home. I'm interested in vegetables and I'm looking forward to learning. I've never used the seed library before. I'm interested in growing in small spaces, apartment balcony, balcony, et cetera. Now, Scott, there are some excellent literature on growing in small spaces. Um, it can be done. You can grow a huge amount of produce in a small space. Uh, my dad had us growing uh, a ton of produce in an overflowing balcony garden in, in urban Toronto. And that's how I got my start. Uh, so rooftop gardens actually can be quite productive. They get full sun typically, you know, um, very hot. You just gotta make sure that you get them well watered. And that's where uh, I would recommend looking into sub-irrigated planters, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Janet says, I'm just looking to learn about beginning to grow a few veggies in my backyard. Thanks for this opportunity. Good luck, Janet. Um, start small. Start with things that you really love. Um, start with just a few things I would recommend and then do those well and then expand in the future. And Janine says, hi, I'm Janine. I'm here because I love seeds and growing plants from seeds. I'm currently growing lots of plants for the St. Paul's Community Sharing Garden. Amazing. Thanks, Janine. I love walking past that garden uh, as I go up and down Coldwater Road there. And Gavi says, I'm Gavi Swan Mansfield. My daughter Morgan and I are creating a butterfly way in Aurelia, and we are trying to grow many native plants from seed. We are excited and terrified. Well, that is very exciting. I wouldn't be so terrified. I think you can do it. Um, but I'm more intrigued about this butterfly way in Aurelia. If you have any more information about that, I'd love to, uh, to learn more. I've been working uh, alongside Bob Bowles. Uh, he's a local naturalist and he runs the Ontario Master Naturalist Program at 
Lakehead Aurelia. And we've adapted the program for a few high schools in the region. And tomorrow I'm excited to see some presentations from a grade 11 environmental science class, uh, Patrick Fogarty. They've got a special project on pollinators and butterflies. And so they've got some projects that they've brainstormed to try to support our uh, pollinators and monarchs especially. Uh, but all pollinators are really suffering with you know, everything going on in the world, especially the way in which us humans have kind of run amok and uh, haven't been so thoughtful and respectful of others who share this earth with us. So it's exciting to see this uh, initiative that you have there with the Butterfly Way. If you uh, need any help, let us know, happy to support. And Shanika introduced herself at the top here and says, I'm here to learn more about the garden in my backyard, how to sustain it and how to collect seeds if possible for future seasons. I haven't used the seed library, but I'm a big fan of Bass Lake Farm and the amazing work they do. Thank you, Shanika. Uh, sorry to miss you last week. We were in Barrie as well. Uh, we missed you there, but we have tons of seeds here um, for you. Looking forward to connect as well. Um, let's see here, some new. So uh, Janet asks, for someone just starting out with a preschool grandchild, what are the easiest veggies for growing in pots? So that's a great question, Janet. Um, one of the one of the popular ones grown with kids in pots are beans, peas and beans. Now kids can sometimes have some like motor challenges with their hands and handling little tiny seeds can sometimes be difficult. So peas and beans are nice large seeds. They're typically familiar to kids. They're something they like eating and it's something they could actually just snack on without having to cook or prepare. So that can be kind of fun and easy. Um, it's also rewarding to see those beans or those peas like grow like really tall. So that's a good one to start. I'd also ask your grandchild like what what they want to grow. What do they like to eat? You know, what are they excited about? And, and go go along with them because uh, you want them to be excited about it and you want them to be kind of leading the process as well in some ways. Lettuces are also pretty easy to grow. I also like to grow like green onions. You get green onion sets uh, sometimes from the garden centers and little bulbs and you just put those on the ground and those are a sure thing. Also potatoes although they're not so easy to grow in pots, but kids love growing potatoes and harvesting potatoes, so. Um, Maureen says, I started the false indigo seed, but it required a lot of patience and stratification, then germination. Managed it and I have six plants growing right now. It is a native plant, are you familiar with it? Absolutely, congratulations, Maureen. Uh, Maureen, you've, uh, you did it. You grew the false indigo. Now the hard part is taking care of it for the next however many years until it matures. Uh, I have grown it from seed before, but I do know that it takes a few years for it to actually get get to a sizable plant. Um, also, it does like to grow in clumps. So if you can grow it together, uh, grow those together, they'll help support each other. And it's a beautiful plant. And uh, the false indigo, I, I assume it's the blue false indigo, um, also um, said to have been uh, and used historically and contemporarily as a dye. The roots can be used as a purple dye. So, you know, we grow plants not just for food to feed us, but we grow food plants for medicine. Um, we can grow food for our plants for fibers um, and textiles for our clothes and our building materials, um, but also our dyes. Um, but also we're growing plants for energy. You know, we can use um, plant-based energy. Um, and all kinds of different things. So, you know, growing plants is, you know, it's more than just growing for food. And Gabby says here, we started our milkweed indoors. Um, at what point can we harden it off? Now, good question. I think, you know, it's safe to bring that milkweed outside. Uh, milkweed is a, is a native wildflower. So I would put it outside and this is a good question here. You say harden off. And if people aren't familiar with what that means, basically, when we're growing plants inside, we're really depriving them of a lot of the conditions that they would be experiencing if they were outside. So potentially they're not getting as much direct sunlight. They may not be getting as much wind or as much fluctuations in temperature. So if you were just to bring a plant from indoors to outside and all of a sudden it's getting full sun, hot and dry, super windy, that plant could be super stressed um, and it can even die if you're not careful, or it can be set back considerably. So we harden plants off, we gradually introduce them to these new conditions. And I would say milkweed is pretty is a pretty sturdy plant generally, um, but you can begin to bring that outdoors. So you can start bringing outdoors, putting it in somewhere with like 
limited light conditions just so we can get you know accustomed to the temperature flux and maybe the wind and then you know slowly planting it outdoors but also milkweed is one you can start um, if you don't want to do the whole cold stratification in the fridge thing you can actually seed these wildflowers in the fall as they would do naturally and you can seed them where you want them growing uh, and then they'll they'll know when to sprout when it's safe to sprout typically in the spring and they'll make that decision uh, that's best for them and sometimes that can actually result in less work for us so that's an option too charlene says thanks jacob this has been very helpful this is my first year of starting vegetables early with seeds in the house my grandchild is pretty excited to see the peas shooting up who's not excited to see peas shooting up um i have a big bag of peas here over the winter we actually do pea shoots so you can lay those out on a tray and, and you can harvest pea shoots. Uh, last year, we planted a ton of peas in the garden and uh, so many peas, we, we couldn't actually harvest them all. There's just too many. We didn't have the time. And those pea pods shattered and then we mowed it all down and we tilled it under. And then the fall came and all these pea shoots were growing and we were harvesting and eating pea shoots, um, which were delicious. They were crisp, um, tender, juicy, sweet. It was really nice. Uh, so we were harvesting bunches of pea shoots uh, from the field, field grown pea shoots. Uh, Maureen says, looking forward to learning lots more about seed saving, especially from favorite flower, tree, vegetable seeds. I like your point about not being able to get the varieties you like. Absolutely. Um, some of these varieties that we're growing in our collection, they may be you know, very rare. Some of them may even be threatened or endangered. Um, like on the farm, for example, there's the butternut tree. And that's listed as an endangered species. So it, they're very hard to get seeds from these plants. Um, so if you have an endangered species, you know, you really have to take care of it, save those seeds, grow them as best you can. Um, so you may be holding on to some endangered species in your in your yard or in your collection. And, and the agricultural biodiversity, the biodiversity in our gardens is really important uh, for many reasons, at uh, least of which is it's it's important for us just to have that variety and diversity in our lives. Gabby says, thanks for this. Also, I hope this is okay to say, but if anyone really is interested in helping create a butterfly way, David Suzuki Foundation project, please get in touch with Morgan's Monarchs on Facebook. We aim to create 12 native plant gardens. Amazing. Um, yes, that is okay to say that and invite people to get involved. Um, I'll definitely be checking that out later and reaching out. I look forward to uh, connecting and getting those gardens growing. And Maureen says, just planted some borage seeds. I don't know how they take to germinate, but hoping they do. Now, borage, yeah. Borage likes the heat. Typically, borage, uh, uh, you know, it's from the Middle East, and it grows these big, broad, fuzzy leaves with kind of star-shaped blue and sometimes pink flowers that are edible. And the leaves are edible, too. And um, they've been used, uh, the leaves, in culinary purposes, you can wrap wrap those cucumber um, tasting leaves use them to wrap you know rice and beans and veg and meat whatever you have and you can use those as a wrapping but borage likes the hot weather so typically i have borage self seeding it's growing in the garden and they don't usually spread until the end of may in the garden there so if you can get your your borage seed some heat i'm sure they'll really appreciate that chances thanks chances must go now thanks so much so much uh, well, thank you, everyone. I think we have about three more minutes here until the uh, the session ends. So if anyone has any uh, additional questions uh, or comments, I'd uh, love to have them. Just have a little sip of water here. That's my pleasure. And Maureen says, thanks, this was great learning. We'll use and contribute to the library and follow up visit to Bass Lake Farms. Before we call it quits there, uh, Jacob, I just wanna say thank you so much for this. I think everybody learned a lot. Um, great plugs for our library and for your farm and you know for the community gardens it's all it's really amazing so hopefully people learn some really great stuff here so it's much to say thank you um i'm gonna pop out and if anyone else has questions they're welcome to finish up for the next minute or two awesome thank you
Certainly someone has something to say. One last question. Well, if nobody has anything else to say, I'm going to say thank you, everyone. It's been uh, my pleasure, and I look forward to uh, connecting with you all in the future. Um, our team does go down to the Aurelia Farmers Market every Saturday, and we have some seeds available there, and we're always happy to talk seed there. Um, but again, you can always reach out. I look forward to hearing from any of you uh, and any updates about your gardens. I'd love to know. Um, send me pictures. Invite me over. And I come take a peek. Can save some seed together. Thank you, Liz. All right, have a great night, everyone. Get outside. It's beautiful out there. Thanks so much, Jacob. Peace.